Critique of Benatar's Asymmetry Argument for Antinatalism Introduction David Benatar presented an argument ending with the conclusion that coming into existence is always a harm, and because of this we should not bring any sentient beings into existence. I will briefly rehash the asymmetry of benefits and harms from Benatar's 2006 book Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. You may want to skip this part if you are already familiar with it. Then I'll show my criticism of the support Benatar gives for his asymmetry. This I will follow with a criticism of the entire antinatalist argument. I will end with a weaker version of the argument that is consistent with Benatar's. The harm and benefit asymmetry. Benatar presents the difference between harms and benefits on which the argument is based. The commonly held view is that the presence of harm is bad, while the presence of benefit is good. The situation is symmetrical in the case of the presence of these states, but the symmetry breaks when looking at the absence, where the absence of harm is good even though no one enjoys this good, but the absence of benefit is not bad unless someone is deprived of it. The comparisons can be presented in a table. This axiological asymmetry is supposed to explain four basic pairs of intuitions that are commonly held. I will go over them shortly. According to Benatar, it follows from the asymmetry that coming into existence has no advantages over, but has only disadvantages relative to never existing. The critique. I will try to attack the argument in a few ways. First, I'll try to show that we have grounds to reject some basic asymmetries, which makes the axiological asymmetry less plausible or even false. Second, I'll try to show that when we include additional common intuitions, the power of the axiological asymmetry is weakened. Lastly, I will show that Benatar's argument is insufficiently argued for, as it misses support for a major unstated premise. Questions regarding the four basic asymmetries. Benatar says his axiological asymmetry explains the four other commonly held asymmetries. Two questions immediately come to mind. First, are these pairs of intuitions indeed commonly held and can we trust them? Second, why take only these four asymmetries into account? The first question is about the validity of the asymmetries. We may disagree with them, we may find them naive or unconvincing. The second question is about the scope of what the axiological asymmetry aims to explain. Are the basic asymmetries valid? It should be possible to analyze any of the four basic asymmetries and at least doubt it. If the axiological asymmetry entails some basic asymmetry that we've rejected, we would have grounds to reject the axiological asymmetry itself, as it wouldn't be able to accommodate the updated set of intuitions. Let's take a look at the prospective beneficence asymmetry. It goes like this. It is strange to cite as a reason for having a child that that child will thereby be benefited. It is not similarly strange to cite as a reason for not having a child that that child will suffer. It is a commonly held view that we should take care of the environment for the sake of future generations. Many people advocate responsible use of resources, actions to fight climate change, technological improvements and so on. Among the reasons people give is the one about our duty towards future generations. We should allow them to pursue happiness for themselves and not be overtaken by cleaning up the mess we made. We have their interests in mind. One can claim that it's good to continue working on various technological improvements and to bring about future generations so that they can enjoy all those benefits of science and culture. 
If we can make such judgments for future generations, then it's plausible that one can say one is having a child and does something for the child so that the child will thus be benefited. It's plausible the same reasoning can be applied to bringing the child into existence in the first place, so that she can experience the world the parents are preparing for her. We can try to argue that the prospective beneficence asymmetry is a naive intuition and a deeper analysis leads us to reject it. Alternatively, we can look at what Benatar says about the interests of those who are being brought into existence. Children cannot be brought into existence for their own sakes. And whatever people might think, their having children cannot actually be for those children's sakes. If the reasons for having children are to bestow a benefit on those children, then they are mistaken. Looking back at the four basic asymmetries, we see an emotional and moral attitude towards those who were brought into existence and those who were not brought into existence. For example, we are relieved that a person who would suffer horribly had not been brought into existence and we are joyful when the one brought into existence leads a happy life. But when the parents abstain from procreation, there is no such person. We are not genuinely relieved for the sake of the never existing person. There is no one who benefited from being spared the pains of the existence. There is no one whose interests had been affected. So we can never abstain from procreation for the sake of the one who would have otherwise been brought into existence. This problem is explicit in another pair of intuitions, the retrospective beneficence asymmetry. It's shortly stated as when one has brought a suffering child into existence, it makes sense to regret having brought that child into existence and to regret it for the sake of that child. By contrast, when one fails to bring a happy child into existence, one cannot regret that failure for the sake of the person. This asymmetry considers only regret, as if assuming that harm is the only relevant metric. Let's extend this asymmetry by saying that one can be delighted that one has brought a joyful person into existence and to be happy for the sake of that child, while one cannot be delighted that one hasn't brought a joyful person into existence. Here, we also have a distinction between an existing person with some quality of life versus a merely hypothetical person with the same potential quality of life. But now we're focusing on the positively valenced states. If we include this additional asymmetry, does Benatar's axiological asymmetry still explain the larger set of intuitions? Going back to the previous point about the interests of those who are being brought into existence, we can see that it makes sense to have a moral and emotional attitude towards someone for their sake only when they have been brought into existence. If they haven't been brought into existence, there is no one for the sake of whom we can feel regret or joy. Another pair is the asymmetry of distance suffering and absent happy people, which goes like this. We are rightly sad for distant people who suffer. By contrast, we need not shed any tears for absent happy people on uninhabited planets or uninhabited islands or other regions on our own planet. This is doubtful. It's easy to find places where people had lived for some time but are now abandoned. Such places are Chernobyl. Fukushima, various abandoned cities. When people think of these places, they imagine them teeming with human life. They think of these people in the hypothetical sense. They extend their emotional attitude not just for the empty land, but for these potential people. Benatar writes, we need not shed any tears for absent happy people. But just because we need not shed any tears, 
doesn't mean we cannot have a rational, positive attitude towards these hypothetical people. Sometimes we do indeed have such an attitude, even when we need not have it. Penatar writes that we don't need to have to regret the absence of happy people, but does not write that we in fact don't regret the absence of happy people. This is a crucial difference. If the asymmetry were presented in the actual mode as I presented it, rather than in terms of needs or requirements as Benatar presented it, that would seriously threaten the explanatory power of the axiological asymmetry. In fact, it's likely we are not sad for distant suffering people to the same degree that we are sad for suffering people who are very close to us geographically. Geographical location, presence in the media, similarity of culture, race and religion are all examples of biases that can affect our moral judgments. It's important to identify such biases and correct our moral judgments accordingly if we want to use our moral intuitions as a base for arguments concerning morality. Is our lack of need to lament the non-existent a bias or an examined moral principle we wish to live by? The scope of what the axiological asymmetry aims to explain one of the pairs of intuitions Benatar gives is the asymmetry of procreational duties. While we have a duty to avoid bringing into existence people who would lead miserable lives, we have no duty to bring into existence those who would lead happy lives. This asymmetry considers only duties, positive and negative. We can extend the set of asymmetries by adding one new commonly held intuition, the asymmetry of procreational rights. We have no right to procreate if the child will have a miserable life, but we have the right to procreate if the child will have a good life. Benatar attacks the claim that there is a duty to procreate, saying that there is no such duty, but there is a duty not to procreate. From this, he concludes that there is no moral right to procreate. But this is a conclusion from the axiological asymmetry based on the set of asymmetries that already exclude some intuitions. If we included the asymmetry of procreative rights as a commonly held intuition, would we so readily reach Benatar's conclusion? one could object that there is a good reason not to include it, as it is precisely the issue in question. So we're trying to check whether this particular pair of intuitions is consistent with other intuitions we hold. But then again, why not check the larger set of intuitions and see what conclusions follow from it? The last thing I would like to mention about the scope is the lack of positive duties in any basic asymmetry. This suggests that something else might be going on. There may be a better explanation why we rarely hold any positive duties. Or maybe we hold some relevant positive duties that should be considered when checking whether the axiological asymmetry is at least consistent with a broader range of our moral intuitions. Missing support to reach antinatalist conclusion? Another problem with Benatar's argument is that, although it aims to establish that coming into existence is always a harm, it doesn't entail that we ought not to procreate. Benatar asks this very question. Do my arguments also show that it is actually wrong to have children? That is to say, is there a duty not to procreate, or is procreation neither obligatory nor prohibited? A major premise is missing from the argument. Let's look at the argument stated in an explicit form. P1. If coming into existence is always a harm, then procreation brings about harm. P2. We ought never to bring about harm. C. We ought never to procreate. We need an argument for P2. Why we ought not to bring about harm through procreation when it is permissible to bring about harm in some other cases? 
the argument is not convincing without giving a solid support in favor of this very important premise of the argument. Even if we assume that the axiological asymmetry holds and it leads to the conclusions that coming into existence is always a harm and that procreation harms the one who comes into existence, we still need something more to properly support the antinatalist conclusion that we ought not procreate. Benatar's argument from the axiological asymmetry is not sufficient to establish the antinatalist conclusion. As he writes, one could acknowledge that coming into existence is a harm, even a serious one, and yet say that the considerations that ground the duty, such as the interests of others or divine commands, outweigh the harm. One could say this, but it is highly implausible if the harm of coming into existence is as severe as I have suggested. Later, he adds, I could accept that non-procreation should only be required when the children produced would lead very poor quality lives. This is because I have argued that all lives fall into this category. Therefore, we need strong arguments that coming into existence is not just a harm, but a serious harm to support the conclusion. These arguments can be found in chapter 3. In effect, the argument from the axiological asymmetry requires the arguments about the quality of life to establish the antinatalist conclusion. Banatar states that serving one's own interests is not always bad. However, where doing so inflicts significant harm on others, it is usually not justified. This is a critical point. Here, Benatar suggests that inflicting significant harms is usually not justified. Is bringing about harm permissible in some situations? If so, then in what situations? And what is it that makes bringing about harm through procreation impermissible? Now, we can take these questions and add the new ones into the argument. P1. If coming into existence is always a serious harm, then procreation brings about serious harm. P2. We ought not to bring about serious harm through procreation. C. We ought not procreate. We see that the argument still needs some serious support for a major premise. This opens up a way to extend the argument, which Benatar does only implicitly. I will sketch an extended argument that includes a version of the precautionary principle. The argument then becomes P1. If coming into existence is always a serious harm, then procreation brings about serious harm. P2. Whenever an action causes significant harm, one is not justified in acting unless one provides a good reason for acting. C. If the prospective parent has no good justification for bringing about serious harm through procreation, he or she should abstain from procreation. This is a much weaker version of the antinatalist argument. One can interpret it in at least these two ways. First, the argument assumes that finding a justification would be very hard, so the practical attitude, abstention from procreation, is already secured. Or second, it shifts the burden of proof to the natalists, the defenders of the morality of procreation, to show a good justification for bringing about serious harm through procreation. Benatar hinted at wanting to put the burden of proof on the natalists when, after listing a variety of interests of other parties that may be served by the parents having offspring, he remarks, some of these are good reasons for people to want to have children, but none of them show why having children is not wrong. And later when he asks, but what if one agrees that coming into existence is a great harm? Is there anything then that could be said to defend baby making? This strikes at the not reflected upon but very much acted upon conviction that procreation requires no justification. Conclusion 
In short, David Benatar constructed an argument that aims to show that never existing has only advantages over coming into existence. Hence, coming into existence is always a harm. This is supposed to show that we should not procreate. The argument is based on basic asymmetries in our moral intuitions. However, we have grounds to be skeptical of them. We may want to examine them and see whether we want to act accordingly or whether we want to reject them. Further, by adding some additional intuitions, we may come to the conclusion that the axiological asymmetry doesn't explain enough, so there might be a better principle that explains our intuitions. And lastly, even if we accept Benatar's axiological asymmetry, the conclusion that we ought not procreate still hasn't been sufficiently argued for. It is possible, though, to construct a weaker argument that still secures the antinatalist position.